And thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. His name was Walter Hickel. Uh, Walter J. Hickel. He was known as Wally when he was a kid. I uh, was born in Kansas, grew up to be a Golden Gloves boxer. As a young man, he struck out on his own to seek his fortune in California. Ultimately, he made his way alone up to Alaska. Uh, his obituary in the New York Times after he died said that he started off in Alaska working as a bartender, uh, then a carpenter, then he was an aircraft inspector, then he bought a half-finished house. He finished it himself, sold it, Bought two more houses, sold them. Eventually, he became a major home builder in Alaska. Then he started a motel chain in Alaska. Ultimately, he opened up a shopping center in Alaska that included the very first escalator in the entire state. What? Stairs that move? Uh, except at that point, Alaska wasn't even a state yet. Wally Hickel was a key part of Alaska lobbying to become a state. He started lobbying for that years before it finally happened in 1959. And then Wally Hickel became the governor of the new state of Alaska just seven years later in 1966. So Wally Hickel was one of those sort of, you know, only in America, incredible man of action success stories, uh, culminating in him becoming both very rich uh, and very influential and becoming governor of his adopted home state. But after he served as Alaska governor in 1966, 1967, 1968, he ascended still higher. He left Alaska, came to Washington, D.C., because President Richard Nixon named Wally Hickel to become part of his cabinet, to become the new Secretary of the Interior. And it seems pretty clear that at the time, Nixon expected Wally Hickel to be a, a, a down-the-line, pro-business, pro-development, pro-drilling kind of guy, and to a certain extent he was. But Wally Hickel also did his own thinking, and he ended up being sort of way too much of a mixed bag for Nixon, even right from the start. By the time Wally Hickel was a couple of years into his tenure in Nixon's cabinet, Nixon seemed to well and truly regret ever bringing Wally Hickel to Washington in the first place. Their relationship broke down entirely shortly after the Kent State shootings, when student protesters against the Vietnam War were shot and killed by National Guardsmen. Secretary Wally Hickel sent a letter to President Nixon on May 20th, 1970, that took an oppositional stance to the Vietnam War. And in a cardinal political sin, his letter to Nixon was leaked to the press and therefore to the public before Nixon ever received it at the White House. Ooh, ooh. Hickel's letter said that Nixon was, quote, embracing a philosophy which appears to lack appropriate concern for a great mass of Americans, our young people. Regardless of how I or any American might feel individually, we have an obligation as leaders to communicate with our youth and listen to their ideas and their problems. Well, that letter was offensive enough to Richard Nixon that Nixon soon fired him. And that was the end of Wally Hickel's tenure as U.S. Secretary of the Interior. Went back to Alaska, became governor again. Uh, that said, around the time that Nixon was firing Walter J. Hickel, Nixon was also doing something really important when it came to the U.S. government, um, and specifically the way the U.S. government works on issues that were totally relevant to Wally Hickel's cabinet agency. This agency that was being run by the dreaded Wally Hickel, President Nixon was right then sort of reorganizing the way the U.S. government dealt with those kinds of issues, Department of the Interior kinds of issues. In 1970, Richard Nixon was in the middle of, in fact, creating a whole new federal agency called... NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And even though there was a new agency being created in 1970, the, the component parts of NOAA weren't new. In fact, they were some of the oldest continually operating parts of the U.S. government, right? dating back to uh, like the Weather Bureau, which was founded in 1870, or the Bureau of Commercial Fisheries, which was founded in 1871. Parts of what would ultimately become NOAA can be traced back to an agency founded by Thomas Jefferson in 1807. The Survey of the Coast, which is an awesome name for a government function. But all this stuff about you know, the oceans and the land and the weather, that's, that's, it's really fundamental old stuff for the U.S. federal government. And there had been a few earlier efforts at reorganizing those sort of science-driven parts of the U.S. government. But by 1970, it was clear that the time had come for a new umbrella agency. They would create NOAA. And obviously, it would be part of the Department of the Interior, right? 
I mean, that is the part of our government that deals with natural sciences, that deals with stuff like land and sea and air. And that's where you think it would go, right? Rationally, yes. <laughs> but history is human, and humans are sometimes things other than rational. Sometimes humans are small thinkers, and grudges can be powerful things. And Richard Nixon hated Wally Hickel so much that I think the idea is that he didn't want to give him anything cool or good or shiny and new. And so in 1970, under Richard Nixon, the newly formed National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, was created not in the Interior Department. Nixon needed to put it somewhere else because he didn't want to give it to Wally Hickel. And so Nixon somewhat in inexplicably decided that NOAA would be part of the Commerce Department. Sure, why not? There's no reason for it to be in the Commerce Department. And there was no reason for it to be in the Commerce Department from the beginning, but that's what Nixon did. If you're wondering what the genesis of this was, apparently it had something to do with President Nixon being unhappy with his Interior Secretary for criticizing him about the Vietnam War. And so he decided not to put NOAA uh, in a uh, what would have been a, a more sensible place. That was President Obama in 2012 trying to kind of fix Richard Nixon's grudge 42 years down the road. President Obama at that time was proposing that the Weather Service and all the other component parts of NOAA should be put back where they arguably belonged in the first place. Right? They should be part of the Interior Department. That's the part of our government that deals with this kind of stuff. It's a rational argument from President Obama and the Obama administration. It was the kind of reorganization that would just make rational taxonomic sense, right? Uh, that said, it did not fly. And NOAA is still in the Commerce Department. And that is why, on Friday, when it came time for the Trump administration to come down heavy on the acting head of NOAA, when it came time for the Trump White House to tell the head of NOAA reportedly, that his job was on the line. Forget the National Weather Service forecast. Forget the science done at your agency. Forget it. NOAA instead needs to back up President Trump. NOAA instead needs to put out a statement saving the president face for political purposes. When it came time for the freaking Weather Service to start getting political orders to undo their science and instead prop up some random untrue utterance made by the president, when it came time to do that, now you know why the cabinet secretary who had to shoulder that burden, the cabinet secretary who reportedly made that call, was Slippers himself. This guy, Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce, of all people, who, according to the New York Times today, phoned up the acting head of NOAA on Friday and told him that he and all the other top appointees at that agency would be fired unless they put out a new statement from their agency disavowing and undercutting the true and accurate statements and forecasts of the National Weather Service to instead align themselves more closely with the false recent statements by the president. And that reported threat appears to have worked. Quote, the Secretary of Commerce threatened to fire top employees at NOAA on Friday after the agency's Birmingham, Alabama office contradicted President Trump's claim that Hurricane Dorian might hit Alabama. That threat led to an unusual unsigned statement later that day by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, disavowing the office's own position that Alabama was not at risk. The reversal caused widespread anger within the agency and drew criticism from the scientific community that NOAA, a division of the Commerce Department, had been bent to political purposes. According to three people familiar with his actions, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross phoned the acting administrator of NOAA from Greece, where the secretary was traveling for meetings. He instructed Dr. Neil Jacobs to fix the agency's perceived contradiction of the president. According to the New York Times, Dr. Jacobs objected to the demand, but then was told that the political staff at NOAA, including him, would be fired if the situation was not fixed. Dr. Jacobs then personally participated in drafting the statement that Wilbur Ross demanded and did as he was told, put out this statement undercutting his own employees and the scientific work of his own agency, which was accurate and correct and properly reported. And the response was in fact blistering. Uh, the scientist who was the chief operating officer of NOAA under President Obama said, quote, perhaps the darkest day ever for leadership. Don't know how they will ever look their workforce in the eye again. Moral cowardice. Again, he was the COO of NOAA under President Obama. 
The head of the union that represents employees at the National Weather Service says, quote, I have never been so embarrassed by NOAA. What they did is just disgusting. Let me assure you, the hardworking employees of the National Weather Service had nothing to do with the utterly disgusting and disingenuous tweet sent out by NOAA management. Uh, by Sunday, by yesterday, uh, the National Weather Service had sent an all-hands email to its entire workforce, basically trying to, I think, preserve morale, excuse me, Saturday, not Sunday, uh, to preserve morale and, and stand up for their own workforce in, in the face of this just really embarrassing fiasco. The all-hands email on Saturday to National Weather Service staff said, quote, we want to assure you that we stand behind our entire workforce and the integrity of the forecast process. We continue to embrace and uphold the essential integrity of the entire forecast process as it was applied by all National Weather Service offices to ensure public safety first and foremost, with all in all capital letters. Today, the head of the National Weather Service spoke at a weather conference that, coincidentally, was held in Alabama, in Huntsville, Alabama. And it's interesting. You've got the, the, the Commerce Secretary, right? The, the, the Com Department of Commerce is the cabinet-level agency. Then it's NOAA, which is the umbrella agency. And then the National Weather Service is within that. Here's the head of the National Weather Service today speaking at this conference in the midst of this incredible, unprecedented, weird political pressure on that agency to lie to help the president, to undercut their own science, to undercut their own forecasts, which the public needs to count on. I mean, in the midst of this incredible situation, we've learned that the acting administrator of NOAA went along with it, objected, but then went along with it. What's the Weather Service guy going to do? Well, he gets up at this weather conference and models good behavior. Makes clear that whatever pressure the, the, there has been on the, the leadership of that agency, including presumably on him, whatever the Trump-appointed leadership of NOAA was willing to bow to in terms of weird anti-scientific political pressure, at the level of the National Weather Service at least, nah, not having it. The Birmingham office did this to stop public panic, to ensure public safety. The same goal as all the National Weather Service offices were working toward at that time. The integrity of the forecast process was maintained by the Birmingham office and across the entire National Weather Service, and actually the entire enterprise, including the local media. So I'd like to close by asking the Sue, Kevin Laws, and the Birmingham employees that are present to please stand and be recognized. The head of the National Weather Service saying that what the Birmingham, Alabama National Weather Service office did here was correct. The Birmingham office did this to stop public panic, to ensure public safety. The integrity of the forecast process was maintained. And then you see the standing ovation. That happened today. NOAA's the overall agency, right? That's who gets the call from the cabinet secretary that oversees them telling them, you're going to be fired if you don't disavow your own workforce and your own science and instead put out something that bolsters the president. The leadership at NOAA apparently went ahead and did that. And that agency is now convulsed over that absolutely unprecedented impingement on their scientific integrity, which really, at the end of the day, is all they have. But the chief of the National Weather Service, which is a component part of that agency, the National Weather Service is not having it and not going along with it. And you can see that from the standing ovation that the Birmingham office got there today that he basically asked for. He himself got his own standing ovation at this weather conference today uh, for having praised their integrity. Basically saying, listen, they contradicted the president and they had, they've, they've, been, <laughs> they've been undercut by their own agency for doing so, but they did the right thing. They had integrity. Well, the top scientific official at NOAA top scientist at that agency has now announced that he will investigate what happened here and whether it violates the administrative order that governs the scientific integrity at NOAA. Quote, my understanding is that this intervention to contradict the forecaster was not based on science, but on external factors, including reputation and appearance. The content of this news release is very concerning as it compromises the ability of NOAA to convey life-saving information. If the public cannot trust our information or we debase our forecasters' warnings and products, that specific danger arises. He says, quote, I have a responsibility to pursue these truths. I will. 
Now, for his part, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross um, is not explicitly denying the reporting that he placed this call to the head of NOAA on Friday that resulted in NOAA putting out this crazy, sci- uh, crazy statement undercutting the science of their own agency. But Wilbur Ross's office is denying that on that call he threatened to fire anyone. I mean, we'll see in terms of the chief scientific officer at NOAA investigating this in terms of a matter of scientific integrity. We have also since learned that the inspector general for the whole Department of Commerce Commerce is now going to investigate this matter. And there are now thunderous cries from multiple members of Congress that Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross should resign over this whole debacle. Other than that, a pretty normal Monday. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.